Power of Myth. I'm your host, Boston Blake. Picking up where we left off, Aphrodite had just bubbled up from the sea. As the goddess of love and beauty, her province included the girlish whispers, smiles, deceptions, sweet pleasure, intimacy, and tenderness. And as you may recall, the foam Aphrodite came from was caused by a family squabble one that resulted in Oranos, the sky god, being castrated by his son Kronos. And Aphrodite was not the only deity that came from Father Sky's severed phallus. Blood from his bits also spilled all over the earth, and from that mixture, the Arrhenes emerged, the Furies. According to Hesiod, there were three of them, three sisters, Megara, Tisiphone, and Alecto. These Fury Sisters were goddesses of retribution. They punished those who commit murder or other heinous acts. When you have done something terrible and you know it, they are the internal voices, the internalized guilt and shame, violence you do against yourself, the voices of conscience that drive you to confess and seek absolution. They drive self-hatred and self-sabotage. And they are relentless and not to be fucked with. Balance will be restored one way or another. Also from Aranus' blood came the giants. A race of, well, giants. Giant beings who were neither gods nor men, but more like men than gods. Facing his son, presumably with his hands between his legs, Aranus named Cronus and his siblings Titans. This was not a compliment. What it actually meant is kind of unclear, but personally, I think it meant something like purveyors of hubris. From Uranus's perspective, they had become full of themselves. They had overreached, overstepped their natural bounds, and were destined to fall. And I think that is particularly poetic today. There could be no better illustration of this interpretation than the sinking of the Titanic. Still, Uranus's accusation seems out of line, seeing as how he would never let them out of their mother's womb. Let's take a moment to unpack this. While this myth has countless layers, levels, and angles, one thing that stands out is that it's partly a cautionary tale to parents, especially husbands and fathers. If you don't actively raise your children, if you don't form a bond with them, then you may very well become their enemy. Children do not remain small. They grow and they grow stronger as you age and weaken. Aranus' suppression of his children may also have been indicative of his unwillingness to share Gaia's attention with them. After all, then there would be less time for sex, and who wants less time for sex? And until this moment, the world did not have Aphrodite, only Eros. Eros was more primal, more simple magnetism between opposites. Aphrodite brought in the personal, flirtation and seduction, titillation and pleasure. With Aphrodite present, sex was no longer just about raw passion and mating. It had the potential for playfulness and pleasure for both partners. Oranos drifted away from the earth into the sky in shame. These events must have profoundly impacted Nyx, the night goddess, who, upon hearing Uranus' screams, immediately gave birth to a litter, and without the help of her partner Erebus. First came Moros, or Doom. Then came Apate, Deceit. The Romans called him Fraus, which is where we get the word fraud. Geras, old age, followed. The ancient Greeks were not nearly so frightened of old age as we are today. So few lived to see it, after all. Geras traded strength and agility for dignity, wisdom, and authority. His Roman name was Synectus, and it connects etymologically to senior and senate and senile. And then the brothers Thanatos and Hypnos, death and sleep, respectively, as well as what Hesiod called the entire tribe of dreams. Nyx also birthed the twins, Oisis, the goddess of grief and misery, and Momus, the god of blame, but also satire. I'm particularly fascinated by Oisis and Momus, who represent two sets of responses to tragedy. Internalized grief and misery, on one hand, and externally focused blame and satirical humor, on the other. 
I myself tend to hang more with Momus in his satirical humor, which makes me really fun at funerals. Nearly all stand-up comedians are channeling Momus. If you want to really experience Momus, check out Ricky Gervais' Netflix comedy, Afterlife. The way I see it, that series is the story of integrating the archetype, of moving from a destructive to a healthier relationship, with and through biting humor. Now, Nix's labor still unfinished, she bore the Hesperides, which meant daughters of the evening. They were nymphs who tended an apple orchard out beyond the Western Sea, which produced golden fruit. And the fates, who would spin, measure, and cut the threads that weave the destiny of the world. And with one final push, Nyx popped out Nemesis, the goddess of vengeance, and her sister Strife, who's also called Eris, the goddess of discord, and whose defining feature was her eternal resentment. Strife was extraordinarily fertile herself. No sooner did she arrive in the cosmos than she began producing her own offspring. Hard work, neglect, famine, tearful pain, battles, fights, murders, lies, lawlessness, and disaster. Of all Strife's children, Oath is the most dangerous. When someone knowingly swears falsely, it brings more grief and trouble than all its kin. With Oratos removed from the mating dance, Gaia paired with Pontus, who you may recall was Gaia's other fatherless son. If you're an immortal god and everything in creation is your own family, I guess incest is really the only option. From earth and sea came the sons Thomas, Phorcys, or Phorcus. Thomas and Phorcus are really obscure figures in Greek myth. But from their branch of the family tree came some important and interesting figures. Thomas married Electra, the daughter of the titan Oceanus, and together they had the gentle Iris, the rainbow goddess, and the deadly harpies, flying bird women who embodied the storm winds. Phorcus and his wife Ceto bore the gray eye, which literally means old women. Now, the Grey Eye were born old and gray-haired and would remain so. They were sometimes called the Grey Sisters, and though there were three of them, they all shared a single eye and a single tooth. To see and to eat, they had to take turns using them. The Grey Eye scene in Clash of the Titans made a real impression on me. It established that this quote-unquote hero, Perseus, was a real dick who was scared of three old women who shared a single eye. Yes, they were ugly, but were they dangerous? And once he got what he wanted, he made them scramble around on all fours to find what he had stolen from them. Now, granted, the Grey Sisters were in the process of cooking a human corpse, but Perseus didn't know that. Also of Clash of the Titans fame were the Grey Eyes Sisters, the Gorgons, namely Steno, Eureli, and of course, Medusa. Of the three, only Medusa was mortal, which is ironic since immortality for the Greeks was often defined by being remembered. Everyone remembers Medusa, but have you ever heard the names Steno and Eureli? I can almost hear the Wonder Woman fans out there like raising their hands right now. Now, Ceto and Phorcus had another child, a terrible one, Echidna, the mother of monsters, half-beautiful woman and half-giant snake. She fed on raw flesh in a cavern in an underground cave, and Cronus freed his titan brothers and sisters. And then this generation of titans, now free from their mother's belly, free to walk the world, they paired off. First, Oceanus and Tethys. Oceanus, the great river that encircled the world, mated with Tethys, the sea goddess. From his movement and her depths came 3,000 daughters, known as the Oceanids. And they had 525 sons, the Potomoi, or rivers. Now, two important Potomoi include Nilus, the Nile, and his mysterious brother, Styx, who would connect the earth with the underworld. 
this story already has way too many names to keep track of. So I'm only going to introduce the Oceanids and the Potomoi if they become important to the story. Uh, the Oceanid Clamine, for instance, married the Titan Iapetus. Their children were Prometheus, which means foresight, and Epimetheus, which means hindsight. The mighty Atlas and their brash and arrogant brother, Menetius, whose name translates as doomed power. Another Oceanid, Doris, married the god Nereus, who's sometimes called the Old Man of the Sea. And their daughters would become known as the good-natured sea nymphs, the Nereids. While we're hanging out on this branch of this titanic family tree, I'd also like you to meet Metis, an Oceanid so crafty that she became the goddess of cleverness and cunning. The next Titan power couple were Thea and Hyperion. And Thea's name means wide shining, and she's the goddess of sight. She's responsible for the shine from gold and silver and precious gemstones and other things that are shiny that humans deem valuable. I'd always wondered why humans all over the world have long placed so much value on gold and gems, when the answer is archetypal and simple, because they're shiny, and Thea is behind that phenomenon. Hyperion was the god of observable movement. His name combines hyper, meaning over, with ion, which means going. These titans' parental influence is obvious in their three children, Helios, the sun, Selene, the moon, and the rosy-fingered Eos, the dawn. Hyperion imbues his shining offspring with a subtle movement as they pass across the earth. In some myths, he was the driver of a great golden chariot that carried his son Helios across the sky. It's a metaphorical representation of this active principle, the daily task that would one day pass to his grandnephew, Apollo. And then, two other titans, Phoebe and Coeus. Phoebe, whose name means bright, both physically and intellectually, and she is associated with insight and prophecy. A query into her hubby brother Quaeus reveals that his name gives us words like inquiry and questioning. These two titans are the most philosophical of the bunch, inquiring into and reflecting upon the world. The combination of Phoebe's brilliance and Quaeus's curiosity resulted in two daughters, Leto, the hidden one, and Asteria, the starry one. Asteria would be played by Linda Carter in the movie Wonder Woman 1984. No, sorry, wrong Asteria. This Asteria, which is presumably the namesake of Wonder Woman's lost Amazon sister, was the mother of Hecate, the goddess of crossroads, boundaries, and liminal spaces. Liminal is this space between, the space between consciousness and unconsciousness. But Hecate is best known as the goddess of witchcraft, which is kind of a misnomer. Now, the origins of her name are uncertain, but a likely suggestion is something like she who wills. Willpower, when truly tapped, can seem like magic. Hecate's father was Perseus, not Perseus, but Perseus, one of Gaia's children from her second marriage to Pontus. I think Quaeus and Phoebe as a sort of polar pairing, like opposite their siblings, Hyperion and Thea. Then there was Creus, who wasn't really the titan of anything, like the, the god of placeholders, maybe. But he married Eurybia, one of Gaia and Pontus's kids. Now, Creus and Eurybia are really obscure characters. But their grandkids were famous, including Hecate, the hubristic Phaeton, who went down in a blaze of failure trying to drive Apollo's chariot, and the monstrous Scylla, a beast who hung out with her fellow sea monster, Charybdis. There were two titans who remained unattached for the time being. Themis, for one, the goddess of divine law and natural order. 
Her name means that which is put into place. Her order supersedes any human or societal law. She is cause and effect. Physics, chemistry, biology. She cares nothing for politics, and those who would deny her in an attempt to assert their own law do so at their peril. The other unattached titaness was Nemosyne, whom I really need right now. Nemosyne, titan of memory, help me remember the twelve titans, the nine I have named, yourself of course, and the two who remain. One and two, oceans blue. Oceanus and Tethys, grandfather ocean and grandmother sea. Three and four, never a bore. Hyperion and Theia, make their kids rise and shine. Five and six, a pair of mystics, curious quaeus and reflective Phoebe seek answers and hidden meaning. Seven and eight, hold on, wait. I honestly don't know why Iapetus and Creus crept onto this list. Nine, nemosity, memory and mother of the nine muses. And perfect ten, Themis, divine law and natural order, which leaves two more. Cronus and Rhea. Cronus, as you might expect from the guy who just cut off his father's nuts, was nuts himself and a grade-A asshole. He freed his beautiful brothers and sisters, the Titans, but showed no love for his other brothers, the Cyclopes and Hecatonchires. He sealed them away in the pits of Tartarus. They had no place in his new perfect order, this glorious golden age he intended to usher in and rule with a sharpened sickle. He took his sister, the fertile earth goddess Rhea, as his wife. He forced himself on her. Oranos may not have been much of a dad, but at least Gaia was a willing mate. In fact, she had created Oranos and probably initiated him. Kronos, however, saw the world as his to reap. Even today, we see Kronos in the deathly image of the Grim Reaper, with his skeletal face and great scythe. Uh, Rhea's first child by Kronos was a girl, Hestia. And after the baby arrived, Kronos lifted her, inhaled deeply that newborn baby scent, and gulp, swallowed the infant whole. And he turned and left. Rhea was beside herself. She shouldn't have been surprised. She knew what a titanic monster this guy was, but still. And then it happened again. She gave birth to Demeter. Gulp. Hera. Gulp. Hades. A boy, perhaps. Gulp. Poseidon. Gulp. It had been written in the stars that one of Cronus's children would supplant him as he had overthrown his own father. And Kronos had no intention of allowing that to happen. He had learned from his own parents the folly of leaving his children with their mother. They might conspire against him. So instead of forcing them into Rhea's belly, he took them into his. He made sure that they would always remain contained, part of his design, his plan. Finally, after losing five children to Cronus' insane appetite, Rhea was fed up. Now pregnant with her sixth child, she called to her parents for help. Gaia, horrified at what her son had become, agreed. Together, they hatched a plot to protect the baby. Rhea left for Crete, and with Gaia's help, she delivered the baby in secret in a cave of Mount Lycaeum, baby Zeus. Gaia took the child from Rhea and hid him deep in a cave near Lectos. Rhea then returned to her husband with a great stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, rocking it in her arms. True to form, the Titan King ripped it from her and gobbled it down. Apparently unable to tell the difference between a baby and a rock, Cronus was nobody's bright boy. Zeus grew up under the care of a group of three woodland nymphs. The ash nymph, Adrastea, 
her sister Io, and the goat nymph Amalthea, who nursed the infant god. One day, the impossibly strong baby Zeus broke off a piece of Amalthea's horn, and it became the cornucopia, the horn of plenty, that was always filled with whatever food the bearer desired. When Amalthea died, Zeus took her indestructible hide to make his aegis, a symbol of his power, and he immortalized Amalthea in the night sky as the constellation Capricorn. But before all that, he had a destiny to fulfill. Kronos had caught wind of what had happened and sent agents to kill the child who threatened his rule. To hide, Zeus disguised himself as the lowliest of creatures, a serpent, and transformed his nurse nymph protectors into bears. Approaching manhood, Zeus had become incredibly strong, brave, and generally good-natured, so much so that the Romans called him Jove, which is where we get the word jovial. Finally, the day came for Zeus to face his destiny. All right, now remember Metis, that clever and crafty Oceanid? Well, Zeus had heard of her too, and thought her cunning could come in handy. He found the goddess by an ocean stream, and she gave him a blend of herbs, telling him to seek assistance from his mother, Rhea, which he did. This was the moment Rhea had been waiting for. She was more than happy to help her son exact vengeance, his as well as her own. Rhea appointed Zeus Cronus's cupbearer. All that was needed was a simple disguise. Now, Cronus had never seen his son before, and even if he had, he couldn't tell him from a rock, so it probably wouldn't have mattered anyway. As Metis had instructed... Rhea mixed the herbs into Cronus's drink and sweetened it with honey. Zeus presented the potion to Cronus, who greedily gulped it down. The drink did its work, and Cronus began to heave violently, and he vomited up first the great swaddled stone, and then Zeus's brothers and sisters, in the opposite order that they had been swallowed. First came Poseidon, then Hades, followed by Hera, then Demeter, and finally Hestia. Reborn this way, Zeus's elder siblings became his younger ones. I'll go into the implications of this in a future episode, but regardless of the birth order, they were now full-grown and royally pissed. Zeus planted the stone at Delphi, marking the center of the world, its umphalos, or navel, where it remains to this day. Zeus led his siblings to war, which they waged against the Titans from their camp atop Mount Olympus. The great war, known as the Titanomachy, raged for ten long years. It's kind of like the intergenerational battle between today's boomers and millennials, but with more blood and fewer hashtags. Gaia saw that Zeus's victory lay in enlisting his uncles, the monstrous Cyclopes and the hundred-handed Hecatonchires, who remained locked up in Tartarus. I think of the Cyclopes as Gen Xers. Tartarus might be a fiery sinkhole, but the Cyclopes could roll with it, just kind of hanging out in their room. But since it was Tartarus, the land of punishment, the only tunes available were dubstep. Anyway, Zeus didn't miss a beat. He snuck straight down into the hell pit and sprang the jail beast from their infernal prison. In gratitude, the Cyclopes, who also liked Gen Xers, were really good at making cool shit. They gave Zeus his signature weapon, the Thunderbolt. To Hades, they gave the Helmet of Darkness, a headpiece with advanced cloaking technology that rendered him invisible. And Poseidon received a trident. You know, a giant fish fork. Then they all laughed about it later. And the goddesses received fuck squat because patriarchy. Anyway, the three gods used these awesome weapons to defeat Kronos. Hades snuck into Kronos's chamber unseen and stole his weapons. Poseidon attacked the disarmed Kronos with his trident, but Only as a diversion, it was Zeus who struck the titan down with his lightning bolt, effectively ending this family feud. Zeus confined Kronos and the other titans who fought against him in Tartarus. 
with the Hecaton Kyries stationed outside as their guards. All except Atlas, who had led them in battle. Atlas received a special sentence, to carry the sky on his shoulders for all time. Other titans, who did not take sides in the war, were exiled to the west. And the Cyclopes got upgraded caves and tech to make better gear for the gods. They got to go back to their rooms and largely be left alone, which is all they really wanted anyway. In his book Mythos, Stephen Fry offers a different account of Kronos' punishment. Kronos, who had been an agricultural god dedicated to controlling every aspect of the world, allowing nothing to change, preventing time from moving forward, was sentenced to count every second of time. From that moment on, forever. After all, his name is where we get the words chronic and chronograph, chronological, and so on. With Kronos vanquished, a new ruler rose, of course. Zeus, who had learned from his parents and grandparents, was determined to do things differently. And he wasn't going to do it alone. He saw his brothers and sisters as allies, and they were stronger together. Kronos had been ruler of earth, sea, and sky. The first thing Zeus would do differently was divide the world into three kingdoms. Claiming the land and sky for himself, he proposed his brothers draw straws for the realms of the sea and the underworld. Poseidon drew the long straw and selected the seas for his kingdom, fitting his tumultuous temperament, and leaving the underworld to sullen Hades, who would possess untold riches, ruling over a kingdom full of Earth's precious metals and gems. But he would rarely, if ever, see Mount Olympus again. And the flash of unlimited wealth is nothing next to the abundance of life, with its unlimited ability to renew itself. If only his kingdom had a touch of springtime. <laughs> 